Threats is a film made for one purpose, to depict a nuclear apocalypse as realistically as possible. Here is how it succeeded at that. Let's begin with a story, which is this alternative history what-if scenario where tensions between the United States and the Soviets get so heated that nuclear war breaks out, the narrative focus being pointed at a group of civilians in Sheffield, England, primarily a pregnant woman named Ruth. The first half showing their day-to-day -day activities in a slice-of-life manner as the nuclear war ramps up in the background, and the second half depicting their agonizing struggle for survival. What really helps with the film's realism is just how mundane much of the film's cast and earlier events are. None of the characters are extraordinary heroic archetypes seen in so many Hollywood films, and all we ever see them do is the sort of everyday activities that make up most people's normal lives. Which helps ground the story, and to further aid in this groundedness is the fact that every single character we focus on is powerless. All the civilian characters can do is try to survive and even the few with any sort of power, such as the government officials assigned to handle the situation, prove themselves to be inadequate to do much of anything. This is in stark contrast to most apocalyptic Hollywood films, where the focus is always on some lone, heroic individual who is on a mission to stop the apocalypse or to keep the death toll from exacerbating. And what helps sell the grounded, mundane feel of the film is the casting, which consists entirely of unknowns. Even the film's leading lady, Karen Meeker, is not a star, her IMDb profile even lacking a picture. Thanks to this, one is not distracted by the fact that you've seen every character's face dozens if not hundreds of times before in other films, and are thereby more able to buy them as normal, everyday people and see their characters instead of the actors depicting them. But besides their unknowingness, the cast is also effective in the way they look, no one seeming too glamorous. This runs contrary to regular Hollywood casting, where often, supposedly everyman characters are played by someone plucked right out of a fashion magazine. And despite their obscurity, I can't say that any cast member did a bad job, everyone depicting their characters in a realistic and understated manner. Though I have to give props to Karen Meeker, who, solely based on this performance, deserves far more recognition, as there is not a single moment where I did not find her believable. I especially love the dreary looks she gives throughout the film showing Ruth's downward spiral into hopelessness through her facial expressions alone. Though that is only one half of how the film achieves its realism, the other is its cinematography, which is documentary-like in the way the camera voyeuristically views each scene, every shot handheld, almost as if the cameraman is themselves a character just documenting the film's events. And thanks to this, certain scenes feel less like fiction filmmaking and more akin to footage shot in a war zone. In particular, the scene where Ruth goes to a bombed out hospital and look for aid. <laughs> Though there are times where the film breaks this style and presents its events in an almost surrealistic and stylized manner. For example, the scene preceding the nuclear explosion, where Ruth walks through the ruins of her neighborhood, looking around as if in a daze and in disbelief over what has happened meeting these strange characters, each one depicting different reactions to the bomb, some walking around helpless, others seeming to have gone mad. The scene has this nightmarish mood, aided by the thick smoke and quick cuts of different shots of Ruth's face, perfectly depicting her disoriented state. But what really helps Threads' documentary style is its use of voiceover and on-screen text which are used to convey important information about, for example, the effects of radiation poisoning, or how society as a whole will break down in the wake of a nuclear disaster. Hanging in the atmosphere, the clouds of debris shut out the sun's heat and light. Across large areas of the northern hemisphere, it starts to get dark. It starts to get cold. I am aware that this is a violation of cinema's cardinal rule, show don't tell, but I feel this is more effective than something like having one of the characters exposit the same information. To explain why, I would like to cite a piece of writing advice from one of my favorite authors, Chuck Palahniuk, who some might know as the writer of this book. Now, what he often likes to do is to use non-fiction formats for his novels, such as writing his fictional stories in the form of a mission dispatch, an oral history, or a diary. The reason being that we associate these non-fiction formats with the truth, and are hence more likely to buy the events in these stories if they are written that way. So, by using the style and language of the non-fiction documentary filmmaking format, the film's events are made all the more believable. 
I would also like to add how the timing of each piece of a voiceover and on-screen text is almost always perfect, often serving as an emotional gut punch or tone setter for certain scenes. For example, and we are delving into some slight spoilers here, so jump to this point to avoid, the scene where Ruth, after a long and bitter struggle to survive, is about to give birth. And just before it happens, this appears. Which turns what could be a joyous event into something horrifying. Now besides the film's presentation, it can also be appreciated by how effective it is despite its small budget, which was about £400,000 at the time. And that's a pretty minuscule amount for a film about nuclear war. But director Mick Jackson was able to make up for this with very efficient filmmaking. Take for example this scene, where a row of tanks and military vehicles are driving past this car. Now getting the actual vehicles would have been far too expensive, so instead the shot focuses solely on the car, Mick Jackson creating the illusion of a row of tanks and military vehicles using lights and sound effects. But my favorite example is the nuclear explosion sequence which must have been one of the most challenging and expensive parts of the film due to the special effects and multiple extras. But Mick Jackson was able to save much of the budget by finding houses that were already set for demolition, fixing them up for the pre-explosion scenes so that he could ruin them to his heart's content, then filming in the rubble once the houses were demolished. There are some points where the budget does show, such as these shots where it looks as if they took a still image and then overlaid some shitty smoke effect on it, which just looks like trash. But overall, the film's budgetary restraints are unseen throughout the film. Now, just to close this off, I would like to address some concerns one might have for the film, which is whether it is a useless exercise in misery, and hearing me explain it and seeing some of the footage might bring some people to think just that. Which is not entirely untrue. As the film goes along, it gets more and more despairing, with pretty much no form of levity. And without spoiling it, the ending is far from happy. But I feel like for what the people behind the film were intending to do, this is quite appropriate. You see, when Mick Jackson was researching for the project, one of the scientists he consulted told him about how some people were talking about winnable nuclear wars. And this scientist, not quite agreeing with them, said this. I remember some uh, a scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project said to me, you know, when I hear people talking about winnable nuclear wars, I just wish I could take them to the Mojave Desert, the Nevada Desert, wherever, strip them down to their underwear, and let them watch an actual nuclear explosion from miles away, feel the blistering heat pulse on their skin, and feel the, the, pl the blast waves sweep over them, and shake their heart and their lungs around inside their ribcage. Then they would have a sense of what it was they were talking about, and they wouldn't talk about a winnable nuclear war. And it was then that Jackson set out to create images designed to dissuade people from the idea of a winnable nuclear war, to show in excruciating detail just how destructive such an event would be. Thus, I find the film's pessimistic outlook to be ideal, as a more hopeful ending or story might only serve to placate instead of warn and teach. And if there is any film that can teach people about the dangers of nuclear warfare, it would be Threats.